Rich? You ready to go, Rich? Calling the five o'clock EAC meeting to order. Start over the roll call. Sheila O'Sullivan Feeney. Present. Bill Pinto. Present. Janet Kravonis. Here. Harry Bryant. Dane. Here. Is that your name? So <laughs> Shoemaker. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. And Cindy Mahalo. Present. Okay, all here. Right. Um, moment of silence. Moment of silence and then uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do I have a motion to approve uh, this evening's agenda? Second. Okay. Agenda for this evening has been passed. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes from October 4th? Do I have a second? Second. Minutes have been passed. Bruce, uh, Bruce, Bruce. Probably should have a vote. We probably, we, 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 there's a motion, there's a second, and then we vote. Okay. Do I have a motion? We have the motion. We have the motion. We have the second. Let's vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Yay. <laughs> and we have that for both the agenda and the minutes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me just say this before we start the meeting. I, there's probably too much on here. So I, I may appear rude when I cut people off. Um, or we may uh, have to defer things to a, a future meeting. But we're starting off with a presentation by Noel Smith. Rich, is he here? Yes. Okay. Yes, he is. And he's going to prevent ver present virtually, and uh, he'll be presenting on the sub subject is Soul Rising, uh, Delaware County. You ready to go, Noel? Hold on one second. Are you it's muted? Yeah. I'm muted. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, you're going to have to give me a second. I was unaware that you. Okay. No, can you hear us? I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Oh, that's great. All right. I think I have the ability to share my screen, if that would be okay. You do. All right. Let me uh, go ahead and put my screen up there and um, I'll introduce the topic. And, um, and, and I think this is a, a small or fa fairly informal setting that we can really um, take questions as we go. So feel free to, to go ahead and ask me any questions. And how much time should I plan for? Is it like 10 minutes total or? Can the volume be turned up? I asked how much time he had. Oh, uh, like uh, 15 minutes. Does that work? Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. And you can hear me okay? Yes. We're sir. fine now. And Noel, can you introduce yourself too and let us know? I think you're with the Haverford EAC. Yeah, so I, um, I'm Noel Smith. I'm a resident of Haverford Township, and I'm a fairly new member of the EAC, but I've been involved with 
Solarize Delco for uh, three years. And, um, you know, I get involved with a number of other um, activities in, in the township as well in regards to sustainability. And um, it's, it's now my day job as well. I work for the World Resources Institute and um, spend um, all of my time on sustainability topics. So, hmm. Great. so um, I'll go ahead and start this and, uh, and answer any questions as we go. But uh, Solarize, uh, just to kind of give an introduction to what it is, it's a, it's a national framework. It's uh, really sponsored by the Department of Energy. And it's really to, to allow communities to uh, crowdsource solar but, and, and really um, help people make decisions, uh, well, um, create a sustainable future. But it's really, you know, the Solarize program exists to facilitate decisions for people that um, may not um, know where to get information. It's a big financial uh, investment. Um, who do I get to do it? And so what Solarize Delco does is um, we've, we vet contractors uh, for folks. Uh, we also act as consultants, you know, neighbor to neighbor consulting for them to answer questions that they may have before they go and, and talk to a contractor um, so that they feel more comfortable getting, getting, getting into a project like this and, um, and to help them make decisions on, in, on one of the, you know, bigger home improvement investments that they may make. So, uh, but we've also got vetted contractors and, and with that, we try to get very competitive pricing that goes along with that to, um, to kind of help, you know, kind of mass, get, you know, you get mass pricing, if you will. Uh, so there's a number of organizations that are associated with this. So we're, we're through the one with the Sierra Club is kind of where, where this started. I'll just back it up a little bit. And um, we started out with uh, Solarize Southeast uh, PA and uh, included all the kind of the Philadelphia counties around uh, the southeastern corner of Pennsylvania. And we, um, after a year in, in uh, associated with that, we we broke it off to uh, to run it as Delco. Philadelphia now has their own. I think Montgomery County has their own. Uh, in Chester County. So we, it, it kind of became more, even more localized in Southeastern PA. Uh, right now, the volunteers um, are from Haverford Township, and we'll talk a little bit about how we'd like to, you know, get additional volunteers to expand uh, beyond where we're kind of marketing it now and having success now, because most of the installs are in within Haverford Township, because, you know, we're, we're relying mostly on our own networks to, to get the word out. So we're really trying to, to lower the hurdles that are preventing folks from going solar. Uh, and again, a lot of that has to do with education and being comfortable with it and finding out, you know, who do I get to do this? Um, the process that we go through, and we're going through this right now, uh, we've, um, this is how we go to select uh, a, a, an installer, or it could be potentially multiple installers if we go that route. Uh, but we, we go for bulk purchasing where we can. I mean, it's 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 still low volume, I mean, but you'll, you'll see in a minute how much we've installed. But uh, we do get better pricing by uh, going through this process. Uh, we we have grassroots education, and uh, and then once we go through that, the installer will meet with the homeowner. But we're in the uh, uh, the review process of our current uh, cycle of selecting uh, an installer for 2022. We had. Um, we had the same installer for the last two years and that worked out really well. Um, and we may end up continuing with that installer, but we may, you know, it just, it's just good practice to open it up back to um, additional installers just to make sure that we're, you know, maintaining competitiveness as we go. The price will range depending on, you know, different vari variants, but that's generally where we landed that 240 to 315 a watt, which is fairly competitive actually. Um, again, it's based on your system configuration. We also build in, um, I guess, you know, the bulk discount. Um, so if you get over a certain amount of customers installed, the, the installer will give rebate, rebates to folks. And this, this is designed to um, have neighbors try to um, communicate or get other neighbors involved to, to do this because it's in everyone's advantage. If you get, the more, the more customers you get on, the more uh, discount will apply to your system in that, in that install year. So um, 
so anyway, that's uh, another way to help market the program is to make it in everyone's benefit to have more folks join into the program. So um, Solarize, our, again, these are our team. We, we do the initial assessment. Uh, this is like the neighbor to neighbor consulting. We, we were fairly familiar with solar installs and a good, uh, a good you know, site for it and, and understand how to answer questions. We do have a questionnaire that we put out. Um, so once we get through that process and the um, homeowner is, is comfortable, um, you know, we'll introduce them to the installer and they'll take it from, from there. The homeowners get to make decisions. They'll get, you know, either cash purchase or loan or other options. The installer does all the work. And, and once they sign a contract with the homeowner, they handle everything, permits, the PICO uh, turn up and everything. It's a really, they, they, uh, they take care of the whole process. Uh, we monitor it, uh, get involved if there's any issues, but typically not. It's just um, once it turns over to the installer, it gets put, put in place. And, um, and then the homeowner, yeah, they, they, uh, they get the next 30 years of uh, electricity coming from Sunshine. So, and let's see. So this is our progress to date. Uh, you can see we've got roughly 250 kilowatts installed across 26 properties. And again, I mentioned our challenges. Most of them are in Haverford Township. We need help. We need your help, um, you know, uh, to, to get the word out and even maybe get additional volunteers to, to do some consulting. But we want to we want to really push this forward and, and move up that uh, both the number of installs and the kilowatt hours. There's a lot of benefits to save, um, save money over time. It's a great return on investment. In fact, you reduce your environmental impact as well, which is, of course, why we're doing this. But the moment you put this on, you know, it increases your property values up to like 4%. This is proven through studies uh, in, in actual sales. Um, so even if someone said, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be in the home for the next 30 years or even the next 10 years, really the, the, the price or the, the investment that you make comes back um, in, in terms of the value of the home as well. So um, you can see there's other, there's other benefits here. I won't kind of go through them all as well. Um, we have our website, Solaris Delco. Um, we have our email. Um, and again, looking for your help, um, you know, to kind of get the word out so that we can uh, expand this be beyond the core of where it is now. So I'll uh, pause there and uh, answer any questions you have. So how does Solarize Delco make its money? To, is it a 501c3 or what type of organization are you? Yeah, so uh, we have a, uh, we do have a 501c3 on the back end uh, called Tavis. Uh, that's the, the name right here. So. That's a registered Pennsylvania um, 501c3. Uh, Tavis is san san Sanskrit for energy. Um, and we have a finder's fee, or it's like a fee of 10 cents per uh, watt installed uh, that comes back to um, Solarize that we put right back into the program. So we've advertised in the Delco Times. So we put Facebook ads out. We create marketing materials that gets handed out. So. Uh, that little bit of money that we get back from the installer is turned back into marketing materials to, to try to get more folks to sign up. I think that uh, for the year up to 2022, there is a rebate from the federal government for the installer. Yes, there is a 26% investment uh, tax credit. Uh, so that's... Um, of course, key to making this cost effective for homeowners. And uh, that's been extended through the end of 2023, I believe. And if uh, the current legislation that's been proposed gets um, put into law, that'll extend it for 10 years through 2031, I think. So I'm just curious, has, have you anybody done an assessment of what percentage of the residences, for example, in Haverford Township would likely um, profit from putting panels on the roof. I mean, the reason I'm asking is we have in portions of, large portion of our township, pretty mature tree canopy. And 
On the road I live on, for example, I don't think there are more than maybe three houses that uh, would likely have sufficient um, period of wet sun. And I think you have a pretty good canopy in Haverford Township. Has anybody uh, forced back what percentage might even vaguely be eligible? Well, we, we do. Um... We do have uh, tools available to do that assessment. Um, uh, I can pull up uh, Newtown. Can you see my screen still? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So there's this project sunroof that we use uh, to, um, to assess properties. That's pretty neat. I don't know. I need an actual address, I think. Newtown Square. I don't know. How about the uh, municipal building? Is it possible to, to use? Yeah. yeah. Do you have an address? Can you read out an address for me? 209. What was it? What was the street name? Hollow. Bishop. Oh, Bishop Hollow. Oh, thank you. Okay, I got it. So what Project Sunroof does is it shows you, and, and you'd be surprised how much available uh, roof <laughs> there is. So here's your municipal building. You can see the, the, the brighter yellow is really good. Um, the darker orange is not as good, but still doable. But yeah, you have a lot of um, solar in this. Now let's zoom out a little bit to see kind of your, your township as a, as a whole. These are all the roofs in the community and you can see some of them here are probably shaded where it's darker, these ones that are more yellow uh, have some roof available. Um, so yeah, this, oops, I went too far. This tool uh, will allow us to assess any home. These homes over here have lots of potential on the, on the back roofs. Uh, you can see uh, many of the roofs in this community have all of these community, all these houses have potential. All these do. So you can see this one here is pretty well shaded, so not as much. So there's tools available to answer that question. And, you know, while there is a nice canopy, uh, which is really important, as you know, for um, as we get into a warming world, but there's many homes that have the opportunity. You can see this whole street here is good. This, this street here looks really good over. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of potential in your community for, you can see here it's a shaded street, not so much, but this side of the street has a lot. Um, so it depends, but the tools are out there to do this assessment. And this is one of the things that we would help a homeowner. So before they even go in to see a contractor, we'll bring their home up on this tool and, uh, we can tell them what their potential is for, um, solar before they even have to get into that conversation. That's very interesting. Now, does one have to be able to get their total need of electricity through their Solar panels, or can you get like half an hour? You can certainly get less. Um, I'm a I'm a long time solar user. I installed my system in 2009, and as you can imagine, they weren't as efficient back then. They're about half as efficient as they are today. So I, at the time, I got up to about 90 percent of my home usage, which was really good. I have a 4.2 system. Most systems today are probably double that. Um, but then I bought two electric cars. And so now, you know, the cars use more, more energy, but I don't buy gas anymore. But um, so, yeah, I use, um, yeah, any, anything helps, anything and everything helps. So, in fact, you don't want to go over. You typically want to be somewhere between 90 and 100%, um, you know, is ideal. Um, yeah. So, um, Noel, I have a question about electric vehicles and the potential synergy there. You mentioned yeah have a couple electric vehicles. That's uh, something we've been talking about in some of our recent meetings is um, public charging stations. And um, I noticed on one of your last slides, there was something about that. So can you talk about that both on like the individual residential level uh, of a homeowner's solar panels, you know, providing enough, enough electricity for an electric vehicle. And also like at the municipality, like if, since there's a lot of available roof space here at this municipal building, 
if the municipality wanted to pursue putting in public charging stations, what would the synergies be there? Yeah. Um, so the way we, we look at the, um, the way that solar operates with the Pico grid and, and to, to support kind of the entire ecosystem, um, they're, they're, the synergy is, um, you know, so, so if you wanted to offset or, or provide all, all of the electricity for your home and your cars, you would just need a, a larger system like I mentioned earlier. So that means more roof space. Um, a, a car, depending on how much you drive, can use as much as your entire house. I know it sounds like a lot, but like a car is like a house. And um, in, in terms of its electric use, if you drove your car 20,000 miles a year, that's like adding another house, right? So it really it uses that much energy. So you would need a lot more roof space. So um, the way that I, I see the ecosystem working is the, the, uh, the solar um, kind of, puts more energy onto the grid that's clean energy. So it kind of greens the grid. So you want to do it in, in concert with the Pico grid to kind of make the overall mix of energy uh, lower, lower emission, lower emitting like, like we're doing. Um, so they're, they're, the synergy is that we're, you know, the, the cars will charge from the grid because I, I charge my cars at night um, because that's the, um, when, when Pico has the lowest cost energy and, um, and, and that's when they want me to charge because they have excess capacity at night. So you typically should charge your cars at night when Pico has excess capacity. And then you, you, you put solar on the grid during the day. And so when I produce my solar, it goes onto the grid and my neighbors are consuming those electrons, right? So I know I produce it, but I'm probably, I'm probably providing for you know, my house and the house next to me, or maybe two of them, depending on how sunny it is at the time. I, I might be powering three houses at one time during the day, but at night I'm pulling from my battery called Pico, right? And so that's kind of how the ecosystem works. And um, we want to be able to provide uh, this, so, this renewable energy to offset our overall impact. Um, but again, when we produce it, we're producing more than we need during the day. And then we, we take from the grid at night to, um, to use that as well. So it's kind of like it's, a, it's an ecosystem. I don't know if I answered your question fully in terms of how, the, uh, how, how they, they're compatible or, or they work together with uh, electric car chargers, uh, because the car chargers would be part of that overall ecosystem with the grid. Um, but I, I guess I'll just say that, you know, we need to move vehicles to electrification. We're going to need more electricity to do that. Solar is a, a, a super way to do that because it produces, the sun is shining at our peak usage as well, if you will, like when, you know, the peak usage is during the business day. So the sun is shining when businesses are consuming. So it actually works really uh, well in terms of the overall ecosystem for how we need to um, power in, uh, in with renewable energy going forward. So. Is there a way to sell the power back to the utility company if you have surplus? Yep. Uh, so the way that uh, there's legislation in place that's called net metering. So net metering um, is, is a beautiful thing. Uh, and when I say net metering is you, um, like I said, I'll, I'll produce more energy during the day and uh, it goes back uh, to the grid. And then at night I draw from it. So it nets out. So I don't, I don't pay for any electricity uh, if I've made more during the day. I pull the stuff in at night and it nets off, right? It's called the net, the net metering. So you get full retail value of your energy up to 100% of your usage in a year. Uh, what goes over that, like if you produced 150% of your need during the year and then Pico had that extra 50%, you, you, uh, you don't get full retail for that. You get um, you just the, uh, the generation portion of that if you know how they break up the, the bill. So for up to 100%, you get full 100% retail because you produced it on site. And over that 50%, they have to transmit it then to, to elsewhere, you get the generation charge. So that's why I say it's typically your, your best opportunity is to try to stay you know, near 100%, not, not too much over. So uh, Noel, when you um, try to promote this program throughout Haverford, how do you get momentum? What, what's been the most effective communication technique or recruitment technique um, in terms of generating interest? 
Yeah, so we've done, so going back pre, pre-COVID, we used to do, um, even in, in homes, we would, we would um, advertise it within different mechanisms within the township to say we're doing this seminar on um, solar, solar energy at home. And, you know, we, I, you know, I've done it in my own house where I've had 10, 12 people come in and, you know, we talk about it. And from those events, you know, a certain percentage of them sign up. So that's kind of like our own um, marketing, if you will. And so we, we've done them at the library, we've done them at our community center. And then we went, of course, to uh, doing them online when COVID hit. So we do this as like it, continuing, it, continually educating the community on the, um, the going solar, how it works, how we help, what it means. And we have another presentation that you didn't see today that kind of walks through you know, the whole process in more detail and the finances and, and what have you. But um, so we try to educate people on that and, 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 you know, give them the information they need to get them to, um, you know, come up, come aboard and, and get solar. So that's one way we've marketed it. Again, we put ads, ads. That's the most effective way, by the way, like this, just, just there's, there's webinars or the seminars that we do, you know, in person, neighbor to neighbor are in fact the most effective in getting folks to sign up. Um, but we've also advertised in the Delco Times and Facebook ads. And um, I, don't, I don't know that we've traced any actual signups to the Delco Times ads. So, I don't know. yeah. But again, I think I'm not a marketing specialist. Again, that's part of our, our gaps. But I think the more people see or hear about something, the more effective it is. You know, they see it in multiple places. So we do think it still helps to advertise in the different mediums um, so that folks are more aware but getting to the EACs is important for us uh, again because we think um, if you you know if you wanted to sponsor like um, these webinars that we do in your community we'd be we'd be happy to to do those um, if you can get us the audiences and I think that would be useful mm -hmm. so then we would set up a, a date that we could possibly do a webinar and then have people sign up that they want to attend that I think it's yeah exactly yeah a live person speak to us. Yeah. Now, do you have any solarized Delaware County um, in Newtown Square residents? Because I know in my area, I have three neighbors that have solar. Mm -hmm. I'm in the same area. Yeah, I don't think we have any in Newtown Square right now, no. So in Newtown, uh, in, in Havertown, uh, for the average house, what is the cost investment for the average house? And what would be the square footage for that for a typical house in Havertown? Yeah, a typical house is probably like in the 2,400 square feet range, and you're probably talking about a uh, between a 15 and 20 thousand dollar investment. Uh, you know, after tax incentive to do that. Is that net uh, or is that with the that's, 20? That's, yeah, that's net. That's net okay. investment. Yeah, and then you're probably ending up with a um, a payback period of like eight to ten years, um, meaning that's how long it takes to save. The money to net, you know, to pay that back, um, you know, that's tip. That's how it typically runs, and then everything after that, of course, is you know free. I was actually at Peter's. Um, Peter from your EAC, he had done a solar demonstration at his own house, and I know he had the Tesla battery. He also stored the excess battery that he excess power that he used during the day at his own property. Is that something you recommend or? Well, I, I have a battery in my house as well. Uh, I have the Tesla Powerwall in my basement. Right. Yep. Um, so it's a personal decision. Like I did it because um, I, <laughs> about three years ago, we had one of those crazy March storms that took out trees and power lines. And I was without power for like four days. And I had like the next day, the sun was shining and I had no electricity. So I, um, oh. I just, I just said, well, that's annoying. And I, um, I got the battery for resiliency at the time. Okay. So that's why I got it. But, and it worked out because I, I now work from home and we have a lot more outages than you think. <laughs> and I don't have. Your uh, own home is self-sufficient. Do you only have to go to the grid for anything that you don't generate? No, I don't. I didn't do it for uh, going off the grid. I did it for resiliency. So I don't, I didn't buy a battery big enough to run off the grid. And, and I don't okay. think anyone needs to in this area. Okay. I think that would be, um, you know, you can if you want, but there's no like economic reason to do that or viable reason. Like when the grid goes down now, I, I can run um, 
on a, I would call it on a degraded mode. I didn't, you know, I can't plug in my car. Um, I, I can't use my oven, uh, my electric oven during an outage. Um, so, uh, because I don't want to consume, you know, I can only, I can, I can, I can keep my house running, keep the refrigerator and the lights and the internet on during, you know, continuously with, with on the, on the battery, but I can't run everything I have. Okay. And, um, cause I don't need to, I mean, you know, the outages aren't that frequent and, you know, for the little nuisance, the nuisance ones I don't even get because if we're out for three hours, you know, I just run, you know, I don't have to do anything. I just, it just flips over and runs. But if I was out for a week, I would, I would, you know, I would be careful of my usage so that I would make sure that I'd be good. So that's my recommendation though. Someone could, I mean, I could have put two batteries in and I wouldn't have to worry about anything, but I uh, thought it wasn't worth the expense. So I also, there's another, another, you know, what, what, I'm collecting information on time of use pricing now, uh, and we can come back and talk about that in more detail when I when I understand it better. But um, the batteries um, can really um, take advantage of time of use pricing, um, so that you you get better um, rates for the energy that you do consume. Who who are the big vendors in terms of the equipment out there? You mean the actual panels themselves? Yeah, who's making those? I mean, we, uh, I, they're, they're made all over, honestly. They're in the U.S., in Canada, in China, Japan, uh, Korea. Um, I, don't, I don't have the name of, of, of the, uh, there's so many of them now. Yeah. 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 But Mitsubishi, I mean, I think, I think mine might be uh, Mitsubishi, actually, but that was like 2009. There's so many more um, vendors now. Paul, is your focus primarily residential, or do you do any business there? Uh, we we uh, we can also do commercial as well. Uh, we had a commercial install a few months ago. A church in Havertown put up our largest array to date. They put up a 44 kilowatt system to uh, offset 100% of their uh, electricity as well. So uh, yeah, uh, there's definitely a commercial opportunity for for these as well. We definitely work with commercial folks. Do you, do you know like? Like if the township could put enough array to cover not only its location here, but it's like to help offset potentially, you know, at our pump stations and things like that. We would, could we get away without putting arrays at every pump station? Could it be at a central location? And then people yeah. would ask to share that. Yeah, there's, uh, so it depends is the answer. I mean, uh, it depends on the distance between the systems. Um, we're, we're looking at the same thing in Hartford Township right now. We, we have the, the same exact question you asked. Um, so the proximity of the panels to the usage matters for that. So there is legislation in Pennsylvania, I think to, to allow exactly what you're saying, but it depends on the distance between them. And I don't know it off the top of my head. So we could, we could do a, a separate, you know, discussion on that to, uh, to kind of lay it out for you and understand that, um, you know, if, if your facilities could, could combine together to, to do solar, that would offset a facility that's, you know, whatever, two miles away or something. Thank you. No, what, uh, what type of ongoing costs are associated with uh, solar? Is, is there anything upkeep that, that you need to constantly maintain or? Yeah, there's no maintenance uh, for the solar. Um, at least, there's no planned maintenance. <laughs> I, um, I, I mean, if you're on a slanted roof, they clean themselves. So when it rains, there's you know when you when, the things that get on it would be like dust or, you know, bird dew. But um, just you know, um, my panels I've never cleaned except once when I took them down for a different reason. Um, but they uh, they generally self clean if they're if they're slanted um if they're on a flat roof you you may want to go up annually and, and hose them hose them off but they're typically you slant them on a on a flat roof as well uh, the inverters are getting a lot better i think when i put my inverter in they told me after about 12 years 10 to 12 years i would have to replace it uh, i'm about 12 years in now and it's still running fine um, but the inverters today, actually, the ones we got uh, with my church, I think, have a 25-year warranty. So, yeah. so there, there really are close to no maintenance on them as well. 
Now, what's the weight bearing load of the, the uh, actual device on the roof? Um, yeah, I don't know the exact uh, weighting of them, but I'll just say that before any installation is done, or in a structural inspection has to occur to ensure that um, the, the weight of the panels are uh, will be held up by the roof. But I'll just say that any modern building would hold them. You really would only, you know, like any any mod any building made with modern building codes would would hold them. If you had a historical property that didn't, you know, that had a roof span that was longer than what they would allow today with structure, then you you, you might have to beef it up. But the structural inspection will uh, will will bear that out. Um, We had more questions. No, that was a great presentation. Great. I uh, appreciate your time. And if you have any other uh, questions for us, just uh, reach out and let me know. It's good to know you're a great resource there for us. All right. yeah. We'll be talking again. All right. Take care. Thank you. No. Thank you. Thank you. That would be great for like now and for the petticoat leagues because they they're in the sun category mm -hmm. and it would be a cost for savings mm -hmm. for them. I mean, oh, well, for the churches that there is a way to finance that that it really doesn't fall on the uh, members of the church somehow or other. Uh, That's they true. have a group of financers that then recoup their money. Mm -hmm. so, uh, Fund. Yeah. To mm -hmm. that. I would suspect there's a loan program out there. I should have asked that because twenty dollars, twenty thousand dollars is a big pop for a lot of people initially. But if you could put it on some kind of a loan program, it wouldn't hurt as much in the beginning. Sure. Hey, there, there's definitely those type of programs out there. Mm -hmm. you, just, you just want to be careful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. because sometimes they're not transferable. Okay. And so when you go to sell. Issues. Mm -hmm. And so you have to just go down the right path with right. this kind of thing. Because mm -hmm. most people aren't staying in their house for that, that you know, they right. like, get in and you know, 30 years is a long time. So. Right. right. Next item on the agenda is Cindy attended a, uh, a stormwater workshop at Villanova University this month or? Twelve, And in the interest of time, I will defer and say that I'll just send a written update to everybody. Thank you. That's even better. Thank you. Yeah, even better. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, both Janet and Sheila attended the... Uh, oh, and Joe. And Joe, I'm Joe sorry, was attended the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the EIC conference. And which which one of you wants to just give us a brief update on uh, what you heard? Well, I came with the uh, agenda for the evening, oh, so, uh, so I'll, I'll I'll start. Uh, I thought it was very well organized and attended. Uh, they started out with a brief ten to fifteen minute presentation from uh, four different uh, groups, and the first one was uh, PA Climate action plan and that's how local governments can take uh, climate action um, i had hoped that we would have had a uh, copy of the recording by this time it's not come out so i do have to pass on to everyone uh, i went online and uh, got to the websites from the people who were making the presentations so that that you could go directly there uh, for and the state really has a lot of information that I think we would help us to be able to move forward if we're actually going to do a climate action plan, which seems to be what many of the uh, surrounding communities are doing. Even, the, for example, Haverford has one, even they are, are a sustainable PA, and, and they're working with Ready for 100 as well. So it's uh, just information that helps get us <laughs> that we know oh, we're going on the right path. Uh, then there was a presentation from the Delaware County Sustainability Action and Municipal Resources. And this is the, the new organization 
of uh, Sustainable Sustainability Officer from Delaware County. I think we had a presentation. From, was, yes, uh, there's two of them. There's yes, the Francine two, Block uh, and Sharon. It's hard to take in all that information and, and remember it. So that I, I've also included the website for Delco Office of Sustainability. And then the, the Pennsylvania also has a climate action plan uh, that for the state and for individual uh, communities. So it would be good to log into that as well. Um, the, the last uh, part was from Tredifferin Township and they had an energy transition plan uh, but they also presented from two young girls, high schoolers, uh, how they have been involved in something to help uh, to different township. Um, and uh, so they, they excitedly talked about uh, Trex benches, which uh, they have been able to purchase from the collecting of uh, some of those plastic bags that we think we use or recycle, although I think our recycling uh, alert does collect those particular ones that have more than one type of uh, plastic silver lining. Um, but, but they at Tredifferin had mentioned that they had these two young girls were part of uh, their associate EAC members on their committee. So they attend meetings. I thought it was a great idea. I know we've talked about it here. I think Joe is the one who introduced us to the thought that maybe we should have students come join us. They're not voting members, but they come and they're able to uh, uh, have a voice. So I've reached out as part of the uh, sustainability plan. Uh, I've reached out to <laughs> the high school uh, eco uh, committee chair Jennifer Finley. She has responded that she was is looking forward to working with the Environmental Advisory Council. So uh, Bruce and I are waiting to hear back from her uh, what dates would work for that. I know it's after the ninth for you because mm -hmm. you're, you're not available. <laughs> and so I, I'm hoping at that time that we could sit down with um, not only uh, maybe first with uh, Ms. Finley, but then also with the students and ask them what they have been doing, what their interests are in doing, and see how we can support the high school students um, as a start. But this also reminds me that we have like four different kinds of high schools here in Newtown, where we have Episcopal, we have the public, we have the Catholic, and then there's Delaware Christian. So how is it that we perhaps can pull all of these high schools together in some way to develop a sustainability program where, where these kids interact? Um, anyway, so that's basically what I took away from the uh, presentations. And then I did also talk about what we are doing uh, with our rain gardens, uh, with the uh, Gable Park tree uh, planting, uh, with tree vitalize, and uh, getting the uh, DCCD uh, oversight involved with uh, runoff. Uh, so I thought it was a very good meeting. And I uh, have anything you want to uh, The only other thing is we discussed there. They discussed about the plastic bag ban and how yes. legislation has changed. And that was just a topic of the conversation. And they also brought up a nice idea of curbside composting. And some other you know, counties talked about what they do and how they include that in their trash pickup and the recycling. And some of them use it in their own municipality. And it just is something to consider. I know the last thing you need to hear is another option, but it is saying that 28% of our waste is, you know, um, we have opportunities for compost. So it's something to really consider. And that was interesting. And she did also mention the DEP grant. So that was the only thing I think that, uh, that I extra from what you mentioned, Janet. Now I've been, been in contact with Mother Compost. Uh, I have an opportunity to participate in that. So I get my 
uh, organic material picked up twice a, a month. Uh, I reached out to them and uh, had a, a nice conversation with the uh, owner of the started uh, mother compost. Their uh, uh, organic material goes to Lynn Villa Orchards where it is composted. And then in the spring, they return two five gallon uh, drums of composted material for you, for your, for your garden. I sent on to uh, Mother Compost with uh, Cheryl. She's offered to make a presentation for us as well, uh, how communities can get involved. Uh, I think it's something we should keep working to see how we can do that because organic material should not be put in a landfill. It's to be put back on your garden. Mm -hmm. now, you were also next on the agenda talking okay. about uh, students, but I you did covered that partially. Yes, right. So I'm hoping we can think about for next time uh, actually voting on if we would like to have associate uh, high schoolers become part of the so we'll, we'll have that discussion. Okay. That's a great idea. I, I did print, this is the actual program for the church program. Okay. Um, the, co the competition that they have. And it uh, it literally starts this month on the 15th um, on Recyclable America uh, Recyclables Day. And it ends um, on the 15th of April. And then they give out the awards on April. Yeah. What competition? So this is uh, they 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 um, the, the high school competition essentially. Oh. So they they they, they give out um, the schools compete against each other um, for the plastic film for the collection of plastic film, um, and a school volunteer uh, keeps uh, the records um, and weighs all the recycled material. Material said on average a thirty gallon trash bag will hold six hundred and fifty of these plastic bags and weigh about six pounds. Um, so whoever wins that they get uh, tracks. I don't know if you guys are on. You guys know the tracks is like the like the plastic recycled material that they make right. benches out of. I think they yes. also make um, decks and stuff like that. So uh, they get a bench um, for the school if, if they win the program. And they also get TREX awards. Everybody gets a participation award. So, uh, made out of so, yeah, it's a neat, it's a neat program. And, and I think um, if the, the, the if we do get the, the kids involved um, from the high schools, and I say bring representation from all of them, and, um, and then, you know, maybe we can even it, it, maybe it can morph into them having like a mini competition for for yeah. you know some sort of a subject or whatever, mm -hmm. um, and but we can get them involved in this if they're not already. That that would be a good thing to pass on to the um, the Episcopal Academy Eco Club or Sustainability Club because uh, one of the young women who was helping the able planting. Uh, was the co-president of the new, she's the new co-president at the Episcopal Sustainability Club. She was there with a couple classmates. And she said that the cafeteria was one of the areas that they were gonna focus on, whether it's gonna be food waste or recycling. But I think she did specifically mention plastic. I didn't get the impression it was plastic film, but she might be very interested in that. No, could you start getting Sure. <laughs> So I think there are a lot of opportunities for us to work with students, and I think they are a passionate group, and, and we need to bring them into the conversation. I mean, judging from the presentations that they did, I mean, for all we know, we get some of these kids involved, and they they might be well in advance open up the things we might suggest to them. They might already have you know all these things that are going on, so um, they might teach us something too. Absolutely. So. Yes. Well, and just from a perspective, if I'm looking at it, I see it. Wrong piece. One is obviously getting the young people involved in relationships that they think they matter to EMC, but by getting them involved, it exposes them to local government. And you know, they need to understand that for local government to be successful, it's going to take their involvement in the future. So I see sure. it as a win, sure. win on a lot of levels. So I think that's a great okay. And they'd be out there helping us plant those trees because we're all getting muscle. old. <laughs> yeah, extra muscle for a tree. Well, and, yeah. and, and just even, you know, if somebody, you know, we do internships here because I do internships because I want to make sure people understand how important local government is. Sure. Um, and, you know, from that, we've actually hired a couple um, and that's been great. But I'm, I, you know, I would love to have three interns. 
every year because I think it makes a difference in, you know, Rich was an intern for me in Phoenix. And so, you know, we, we benefited our finance person, you know, and he's looked at government. I don't know if he was set out to do government when he first started. <laughs> but he's stuck now. now. <laughs> the internship was just so bad. <laughs> but, but, I mean, he was doing an MBA program, but it's still, uh, it, it's still just an opportunity sure. for those young people and, and get them involved and hopefully help them to see really there is a place and there's I go to conferences, sorry to say most people look like me. And, um, you know, and it's not an encouraging thing when you look around the room at managers and, you know, more than half of them are my age. And I look at, say, in 10 years, that means half of us are going to be gone. Mm -hmm. And so the need is really great. And so you know, I, I'm very much for getting young people involved, not only for the purpose of environmental issues that we one thing I thought also from the call is, and you mentioned, Jen, the Sustainability Commission, that was Francine Black, and that was Sharon Jane. So we really, we had, I believe Sharon was the one that came in. So we really should get the uh, the chief sustainability officer or see what how we could benefit from her organization, because mm -hmm. it is a county organization. And, you know, they should be helping us. Why are we reinventing the wheel all the time? I mean, we should be able to use resources and, and help communicate effectively with all, all of the counterparts mm -hmm. in the county. And another uh, aspect was the, the renewable energy ordinance framework. So when yes. you're making your ordinances, there are examples out there. So we don't have to sure. start from zero. I, you made mention of the county sustainability. I know that Suzanne is reaching out. Suzanne is being our sustainability coordinator to the county okay. to make sure that we partner together as we move forward. And that would be Francine Block, who's the chief of that sustainability officer. So, because I know um, the Sharon Jane was just the director. So make sure we get in touch with the chief. <laughs> get all the answers or, or information or resources. And, you know, I think a lot of times we would love pamphlets and it, it, things that we can hang out at community events because we it's hard to get information. I mean, you know, we tried to get that from, you know, PHS and, and the county groups and, um, you know, Penn State Extension, they've been very good, but we really don't have resources available. And it's great to provide links and QR codes, but sometimes people like to see, you know, what it means for their everyday life and how we can do that. I will say one other thing in closing. I don't want to stick on this for too long. I know we're in a time crunch, but one of the things I will say I'm happy to be a part of a community like this that actually what I consider that produces and does a lot of stuff for the community because I heard I don't know if you guys caught this, but <laughs> one one group had had jumped on to present and it was I want to say it was Lansdowne. Oh yeah, that was sad. But you did hear. Okay, so I wasn't the only one. I was like, and and the, the woman started talking, and she said, "How? Oh yeah, well we have this program, this program." And then she's like, "But really, nobody's gotten anything done yet behind it." And I was like, and I was driving at the time. I'm like, "Wow, <laughs> like that just does not sound good." But what she was saying, and and what was key was, you know, the EAC is just a support mechanism to the supervisor. So if we, and really at the end of the day, they're the ones who are driving the bus. We're just kind of helping put fuel into the bus and we're just making sure it's green fuel at the end of the day. That's all we could do. So we are kind of supporting them to get their initiatives, but that's what she was saying that yeah. they didn't have the support of the supervisors yeah, okay. to make things happen. So although they're trying to do the right thing, they're not getting the support. So I think from all I can speak for the AC or something for me personally, but I think uh, you guys have done a great job. The township, George, the supervisors have been very supportive of everything that Bruce and the committee has put forth, and uh, I appreciate that. Uh, next on the agenda is the township recycling program, which is going to be very brief because I put that on there because one of our uh, friends of the EAC who can't make it tonight had an interest in two, two aspects of recycling. She was concerned about, is it really being recycled or is it getting mixed with trash? And the other thing she was concerned about was adherence to some level of standards as to what you put in there. And her concern was that she thought her neighbors were throwing stuff in there that perhaps shouldn't be. Um, I don't, I'm going to just give us a comment on that. Uh, 
storage since that's your thing? Sure, sure. I, I can do that because I, I, I'm the recycling coordinator for the township and I'm, I'm the one that works with our, our present vendor. Uh, so first of all, I would say that's something you hear a lot is that people think that maybe recycling is just being thrown out. So if a company were to do that, the DEP would be on them so hard, they wouldn't get back from it. Mm -hmm. I mean, so the, they are required and they, and, and like our current processor has a facility that's mm -hmm. dedicated to recycling. Some of the smaller vendors have to take it to somebody else's facility. Ours actually has a facility that they take it to uh, mm -hmm. that, that handles all the recycling. You know, recycling is at the end of the day, a commodity. Mm -hmm. You know, there, it, it has some value whether, and, and sometimes that value goes up and sometimes that value goes down. Right now, unfortunately, it's on the way back up again, mm -hmm. uh, but they do, so they're not gonna throw money away. You know, they're not gonna go through the trouble of collecting everything and then, and then throw it away. But again, I would say the DEP uh, would absolutely be all over any of the contractors if they were to not be recycling the material. Where people see it a lot is, Maybe they, you know, throw recycling in a blue bin and they throw their trash in a black bin and then the cleaning company comes through and just throws it all together. Mm -hmm. and, and that is something that for sure happens on on local basis. Uh, there are some haulers out there, uh, which is why, you know, it, it's not 100% a hundred percent a solid line. There's some haulers out there that do have a trash to energy program. Um, and I don't want to name exactly who they are, but if they have one, and there's some of the larger facilities in town that actually make use of this contractor, um, that would meet the DEP requirements because there's nothing going into the waste stream. And one of the main purposes of recycling is to make sure that material doesn't go into the waste stream. If they're utilizing it and it's being turned into energy, then it's not going into the waste stream. And, and they're, they're you know, they're meeting that. So there's there's one or two places that people said, we don't recycle here, it all goes together, but it actually is being handled the way the DEP is, is comfortable with it. Not many do that. It's a very expensive process. It's kind of, a, a, you know, a startup, but it, it does happen that way. Um, what was the other item you wanted to ask about? The purity of what goes into- uh, Are the criteria as to what- What's going into the recycling? Yeah. What's being recycled know, versus- yeah. Yeah. Are uh, people obeying them or uh, looking the other way? Sure, sure. So I know when we get our reports, we get an idea of how much residue or trash was put into the recycling. So any of the haulers that, that we deal with, they always report what they had to pull out after they, after they got it. Um, fortunately, and I've been to some of the processing plants that, that handle it. I mean, the truck backs up, it dumps all the material on the conveyor belt, and through manually separating it and also uh, mechanically separating it. I mean, there's, there's blowers and there's magnets and there's all these things and it goes down the conveyor belt and the plastic goes in this direction and the paper goes in that direction and they do separate it out. And then they separate out the trash. So there is trash going in. Fortunately, the haulers are pretty good at separating that out and getting the stuff into reusable uh, piles. Mm -hmm. But it's not enough trash that the haulers are complaining that residents are um, it, abusing. If it's abs if it's exorbitant, uh, the haulers will report it, and and then either we or the haulers notify the people that they're doing it. Most of the time, it's something that's easy for them to separate out, and they don't get too worked up about it. Fortunately, the technology of single stream recycling has come a long way over the number of years, and so. It's good. It's it's not too difficult for them to separate all that trash out again. We never want it to happen, but it's not the end of the world. It's not like one time a tr a full truck full of recycling may have been uh, discarded because it was contaminated. They're able to separate it out pretty well. I saw a letter from somebody who was a Newtown Township resident who was complaining that in letter he made call. Wonderful products recycling once a week. We do it every other week. Frankly, for us, every other week is more than sufficient. I mean, the bin is a big bin, and um, I've never had an issue. But um, anybody else? 
Yeah. I don't have an issue, but there's two of us in our household. That's, well, that's, that's that makes good. a difference. So, I mean, I, 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 so, so I, you, you bring that <laughs> up, and I'm yeah. kind of chuckling yeah. because if you watch the latest uh, yeah. Board of Supervisors meeting, you happen to know we just went out to bid uh, and presented the bids uh, at the last meeting. We had two bids. Uh, or one bid for two different issues. One was collecting every week and one is continuing the current collection. Uh, just to tell you, we currently are at 228, yep. uh, $228,000 a year to collect recycling. The new bids came in to continue what we're doing today. The new bid was 422,000. And if we were to go to weekly recycling, it was four hundred and fifty-eight. Yeah, thirty thousand dollar difference. Uh, so we were looking at a two hundred thousand dollar increase, basically. Uh, okay. So the board rejected the bids, and we're going back out. I will say we were not surprised that the bid went up. We were a little surprised that the week by or twice a month bid went up that much. Uh, <laughs> Well, if you've been paying attention to the news, one of the challenges, there's two challenges. And, and, and as George said, recycling starting to come back, but we had kind of gone in that trough where it was actually costing in some ways to get rid of the recycled goods. Um, the, but the biggest piece, I mean, obviously there's a cost, there's a higher cost in fuel, but the real driver is the fact that it's costing so much to get the drivers and the throwers yeah. and being able to consistently make sure that that you have personnel to do that job um that's the big driver um and you know that's the i mean if you look at where the trend is right now and you look across uh you know multiple areas particularly when it comes to requirements for cdl drivers there's not enough out there and uh, it's a real issue uh, you don't have bus drivers, you know, for schools. You don't have bus drivers for public transportation. You don't have bus drivers for the large trucks. And it trickles down to nobody who wants to be driving a garbage truck. You know, if I have my choice between driving a garbage truck and driving a school bus or driving an over-the-road truck, you know, I might make a choice and the garbage truck may end up pretty far down on the list. So, um, you know, and... That's really what you're doing when you're driving a recycle vehicle, right? So we think that's the driver. Um, we don't know, you know, uh, George has talked to several uh, of the folks and we don't know whether this is a short term, six month, we don't think it's that short, uh, but we've heard, you know, I'm thinking it's a year or two, um, hearing that it may be as long as four or five years uh, that this may be a problem and so, uh, it is a it is a concern, um, but going back to your answer to, to directly answer where you were, uh, if the cost difference comes out to be, we by the way the board rejected all bids, and, and we're bidding it out again, two separate bids trying to get back there. Um, but if it comes back and it's still that much of a gap, uh, I don't know that the board won't make the decision to go to weekly just because for a few, you know, $30,000 more, everybody gets it picked up every week and you're meeting another group who has a need uh, for it to be out every week. Why, why, why what was the explanation between only $30,000 for equal? Yeah. Well, they didn't it's give it, we didn't really ask and they didn't give an explanation. Uh, trucks, might, uh, trucks might be on the But here, here's, what, here's what we do know. And George can uh, weigh in on this, but basically, um, it's not easy for, I mean, when you come in and do half the township in one day, um, you're, we're with three trucks and I don't think they do the whole, like they have to go and dump during the day. They do. And so if we're actually bidding it a little differently this time, we're saying, put it on your schedule to make it work. So we're not, the only thing we're asking is that if you pick up in, Upper St. Albans on Tuesday, you always pick up on up in Upper St. Albans on Tuesday, you know, in that way. Um, and you want us them to communicate that. And we want the them to communicate yeah. that. But it, 
It is, an, it is the concern uh, that we have. I don't know, George, if you want to say something. Yeah, the, the one other thing that I, I think factors in is as a community, we have been successful over the last number of years in encouraging recycling and in having more recyclable material. So as a result, if you look back at like 2015, 2016, we, we recycled about, and I'm talking residential pickup, not, not talking the commercial and all that that, that we, we watch. Um, but the residential pickup, it was about 700 tons a year, which is, which is a lot. Last year, we collected 1,200 tons of recycling. Now, that was COVID, and, and I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to cut back a little bit, but I, I don't think it's going to go a lot lower than maybe, you know, 1,100 going you know, forward. One thing that's pushing it up, it may not be butts, but there's one person on our street, a couple, who get these deals brought in um, from Ebola or Blue Apron or something, and every one of them comes in a big cardboard Absolutely. Every yeah. one of them. So when the recycle goes out, they create this wall of these <laughs> I know. boxes. I mean, it's crazy. Well, and, and again, to your point, with that much more material, and you start looking at that history, you know how many times you're going to need to run back and forth to pick it all up. So I think year, that factors. Um, last year, the um, our recycler sent out the information. Are all of those items, because I thought there was some discrepancy about the items, because there's a couple things here listed that I, I didn't think we did anymore, the bubble wrap and they're on there. Can you send out a, or maybe have them send out the revised list of what is actually picked up now? Because so I, I think when, to your point, I, I think that when uh, the next contract kicks in, there's going to be information that's going to go out to, to everybody. Yeah, this particular vendor invested significantly in their equipment and were able to take on more material than we were requiring them to. And so that was conveyed to everybody. But again, it was it's a kind of a limited time deal. Right. There's no guarantee who the next exactly. caller would wind up being. But for the short term, they were able to take on all this additional stuff. Right. So a question, does any of our trash go to Covanta? The, uh, the uh, burning Chester County, the Covanta plant? All of our recycling is handled by the contractor and they, I think their processing plant might be in Birdsboro, but they, it, it's, it's, they're based out of Bridgeport, but I think their processing center is, is up further. I don't think any of it goes to there though. It's, it's all recycling that, that goes and gets sorted at their, at their central location. But we couldn't, we couldn't speak to trash because each individual contracts with a different contractor. Right. And so in that way, we couldn't speak as to who does or who doesn't take to there. Right, I was only referring to the recycling that's yeah. collected. I wasn't referring yeah. to the trash. Any other questions or comments on the subject of recycling? That was helpful. That was helpful. Uh, next item is a discussion of possibly canceling our December 6th meeting. I don't have any background. Yeah, I'm going to bring up the background. Okay. <laughs> and so um, the board has agreed to recarpet the library. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of November, uh, we're going to take this room and basically tear everything down. And we are going to convert this room into a massive storage room for library books for the month of December so that we can recarpet the library. Uh, we've been having problems with the carpet in the library buckling. Um, it hasn't really worn out, it's just buckling. And so uh, one of the challenges we have is we have to move all the library books out. It's a very labor intensive uh, project. The carpet's the cheap part. <laughs> We're gonna pay for the carpet twice for what it's gonna cost us to do the, the actual project because we have to move all the books out. We have to move the, uh, the bookcases and those kind of things, at least somewhere. Uh, they've got to take up the carpet. They've got to grind the floor, get all of the uh, floor prepared, come back down. We're going back in with carpet tile like we have in here. Uh, so, and then they're going to go back and put everything back. We think it's a two-stage process at this point that they uh, come in, they uh, move all the books out, move half, move 
the bookshelves onto one half of the room, do half of it, and then come in and do the other half, and then put everything back. We think it's going to take about a month, uh, five weeks, something like that. Uh, so we can find places for meetings if a group feels like they need to meet. Mm -hmm. If they think they can get away without meeting in the month of December, uh, we would prefer, uh, because one of the challenges we have, because we're doing recordings, I've got to find a location that can do recordings. Right. Um, and we will do school district where we can. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is the school district doesn't have the room available for every night that we have meetings in the township. So we're working through that. Um, so we are asking groups, uh, if you feel like you can not meet in the month of December, then we would. I move we uh, cancel the December meeting. Well, could we meet virtually? The, the, the That's a question. Um, and there is a question about uh, probably the answer is yes. Uh, the, there is a um The option for meeting virtually was tied to COVID's emergency piece, the declaration. That declaration was not renewed. And so um, for sure, the Board of Supervisors can't. There is a question of whether a, another committee could uh, because of that. And I'm saying that there, there's mixed answers of, from the, that legally of whether they can or cannot. I renew my motion. <laughs> I just I have a question related to that. Yep. What about January? We're anticipating so January. Um, yeah, that's going to be another issue because January usually. When do you all meet? Does it, how do we do that? I forgot. Well, I but you do. Well, the challenge is you have to meet after the reorg, right? Yes. Right. And so I can't remember. Were we doing you guys on Tuesday night? In I, January, I think we did like the 13th this year. We were like two weeks in, I think. Remember, because they had to do the reorganization first. The I yes. thought it was the following Monday as well. The problem is that it's a, I, I think it is. I think that's right. It's the following Monday, um, which by that point, we're, unless something goes wrong, we hope by January 1st, uh, we're, the third is when the board meets to do the reorg. We're hoping to be back in here to do that. And it's the uh, third is the Monday, the tenth is the Monday. The, right. Yes. Uh, yes, yeah. we should be. We should yeah. be done. Even if the even if yeah, even if the work wasn't done, this room should be empty. Right. That's what our hope is. That's that's our plan. So that's the reason why that's on the agenda. Um, we're we're just trying to be wise with resources and how we do those kind of things. That's all. Should take a vote on our ability yes. to- uh, Willingness to- accept Willingness. I'm not sure we always have a second. We only have one. <laughs> but you made the motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay. Do we have anybody? Do we have agreement? Well, we, we, we can vote. vote. We can vote. Let's, let's yeah, you know. Everybody in favor? Aye. 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 Not favor? Okay, we're off in December. January. We're cooperative bunch. You are a cooperative bunch. I thank you. We we were we've been kind of frantically trying to go around and line up places that we can meet. <laughs> Next item we have on the agenda is under the old business category, and uh, that's going to be Cindy talking about the rain garden, and she's going to uh, also. Uh, discussed briefly Gable Park and what we did there uh, in the middle of the month of October. Um, first of all, the rain gardens were planted in September, so I feel like I reported on them in the October meeting. No? You weren't here in the October. You weren't. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, well, the rain garden planting went very well. It was very well supported by volunteers, by the Department of Public Works, by the Manager, the supervisors, um, you all, the master watershed stewards, CRC. Um, we had great weather, great turnout. Um, I can't say enough positive things about all the team members. I said them once I mentioned. 
as well as um, CRC, the Chester Ridley Crown Creek Watershed Association. Uh, we engaged them to help publicize it and recruit volunteers, which we had not done before. I think that was a real plus. Um, it took some burden off of us. And then also we used the landscape firm Green Leader Landscapes, who I thought did a superb job in planning, executing, supervising the event. Um, we had did have some uh, say water damage to the garden in the Little Lake Field due to a very heavy rainstorm. Um, and we have corrected that. There a silt sock, which is big erosion, it looks like a big sausage, has been laid there to help prevent that from happening again and make it repair work. Um, I've been keeping an eye on it a little bit sporadically to keep an eye on the weeds because that's that's a concern. Um, we've helped with the watering. We haven't really needed much of that, thank goodness. And now that we're heading into the winter, we don't really need that. Um, I actually came over with a, a neighbor the other day from Hunter's Run. We did some weeding. The garden out here seems to be in certain places getting a lot more. So that's kind of a, a, a prime concern for the first year is keeping the weeds under control. Um, so that went really well. Bruce and I are mostly him is wrapping up all the paperwork, which is a pain in the neck. Yeah. <laughs> um, about getting paid. About getting paid. And um, then the, the last loose part of that is um, the signage component, which I'm kind of waiting to see where all the costs come in and how much money we have for that. But we are aspiring to have a nice, nice permanent big sign on a pedestal out there and maybe some small literature, plant lists, brochures, maybe in a little clear lucite container on, on the wall. Um, so I think we're in really good shape. Um, and then the gable planting was a month later. And a ditto for that, uh, great support from Public Works, CRC. Um, CRC did, had a much bigger role in that, in that they designed the tree planting, sourced all the trees, um, had them delivered, supervised that, managed. I mean, Dave Hilbert was a little dynamo running around. Like, Whose cart was that that he was driving on? Is that your little... <laughs> Thing. That is public works, yeah. yeah that's, that's it. He loved driving. He, he did enjoy <laughs> that. Yeah, he was buzzing up and back and forth on that. And um, no, I, I just thought it, it went great. And people, Cheryl was there with her friends. And um, people seemed to really enjoy it you know, as, as a community activity and getting involved. So we're hoping to do some permanent signage. Too. And then to me, the big, the next phase is education, having webinars, having tours, and just kind of taking it to the next level. We have this infrastructure here, you know, bringing people in. You know, maybe you start with a webinar here, and then you go out and you take them to the Gable Park with the planting, and then you bring them here and you show them the planting. Mel Hill years ago, you talked to them about the geothermal heat, you know, heating, and you take them up to the Mel field. If you want to keep going, you can take them up to Garrett Williamson and show them some of the modifications they've done by their entrance to help control stormwater. You know, you, you could just have a, an amazing educational here. But Cindy deserves all the credit. Excellent Absolutely. job in, in organizing. Yeah. Teamwork. Much teamwork. Spectacular. Great. And you got a great press release coming out about that. That's great. Yeah. yeah that's and great. the pictures and all that. So that'd be awesome. Mm -hmm. I think I think the thing we did this and it's an ultimate really great real win will be folks from our community. I can do that on a smaller scale in my yard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the real win. That's what yep. we want to remember. Exactly. And that's what we want to encourage. Yeah. Get everybody side. to plan a rain. You know, uh, so <laughs> yep. uh, 
you know, but I, 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 I do think it's key. And it's nice that we'll be able to say, here's an, here's an example. I do, I, I want to say that one of the things I thought was great about that day was really the whole week leading up to it. The amount of volunteers that came out. There were people from our community and from other communities as well. But it's still doable when somebody passed out. So that's what's mm -hmm. important. And the same thing holds true with the uh, native uh, trees. Yeah. One of the Episcopal uh, students that was here uh, went home to his parents and said, if we got to plant some native trees in the property, it's a huge win yeah. as far as I'm concerned. Well, and I sent an email to Janet. I said, we were putting some native plants in here and a woman drove by one of my neighbors and she <laughs> saw us out front and she said, she was the one that planted the Black Eyed Susans in front of the township building 10 years ago. And she'd been monitoring, you know, caring for them for years, but got to be too much. So she was glad to see us putting native plants in and that she had been to the native plant pop-up garden mm -hmm. and got the list and took it <laughs> over to the nursery because she was going to redo her front. And she gave him the list and she goes, I only want plants from this list. Awesome. And took them back and put them in her front yard. Yeah, Wonderful. so that's what we want more of. Mm -hmm. so that's why we're doing it, and why I'm hoping that now that the trees are planted across in uh, uh, what is that called Bishop Hollow? Uh, gable. 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 Right across yeah. there, right? Yep. That we have a place that looks like it's been purposely left for mm -hmm. a pollinator garden for perennials <laughs> and, uh, right along the walkway. <laughs> And we will plan it next spring. We have more money coming from uh, Valley Forge Audubon that we had not spent. They are holding it for us. Uh, we can uh, send it over. And so by spring, we should be able to start small and then keep going. Awesome. And I wanted to thank the township for the opportunity to attend the CRC annual dinner and represent New Town Square. Uh, they've done so much for that uh, is going to to go. And both Mike McGraw and Giselle from Garrett Williamson won awards for it. Oh, awesome. I, I might, I know it wasn't really on the agenda, and I know we're watching. It's really good. Yes. Just with Giselle from Garrett Williamson. The three of us had the opportunity over to Germany and do a tour. And I just would think it would be, you know, a five minute kind of tour back would probably benefit. It's really, I think it's what they're doing there. We want to be supporting what's going on there. We want to kind of just talk about your experience. But I thought it was actually one of the best presenter here. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Steve and Bruce and I had the opportunity to spend two hours at Garrett Williamson uh, property a couple of Fridays ago, and the impetus for this was that they've hired a new arm program manager. Um, the Penn State Extension 4-H program had been there for years, caring for different types of animals. For various reasons, Penn State has ended their activity there. But Garrett Williamson is still very enthusiastic about their property as an educational venue for all different ages from one year olds on up. They've got preschool and nursery school and summer camps and after school programs and just amazing things. They've got 200 students there and they've got multiple programs going on. And the, the three major things that we saw were first, um, Amanda, is that her name, or Naomi? Um, there was a young woman who was the like garden coordinator, and they have this amazing garden that maybe is twice as big as this room, all fenced off from deer. And they grow all kinds of crops there, native you know, heirloom type seeds and shrubs and trees and persimmon trees and currant bushes. And they have this 
very integrated year round program where the kids do everything from harvest the squash in the fall, cut out the seeds, clean the seeds, save the seeds, you know, cook the squash, make bread, eat the squash, you know, and bring the squash home to their parents. And then next spring, go out and plant those same squash. So they see the whole cycle and they repeat this with apples and pears, everything you can think of. So it, it's a wonderful way to get kids involved in understanding where their food comes from, what it takes to grow food um, and, and things like that. They, it's amazing how they have it integrated into their curriculum. Um, so that's the garden. And then they have, um, they rent out an increasing portion of their 200 acres to um, Urban Roots, which is a professional farmer who has been there for several years. He brought his stuff to the uh, farmer's market. He started out doing a high end stroll or andai to restaurants, which tanked during COVID. So then he quickly pivoted and expanded into all different types of groceries and then has vegetable crops and has broadened into a CSA community supported agriculture. Um, and he's every year he turns more and more of his acreage into crops so that he gave us a tour of that. And then in their barn, they have a third full-time professional who just runs the, what well, I call the animals program. And she is a dynamo and got all kinds of ideas. She's cleaned up the barn and refurbished the barn. And it was kind of clean right now because it's kind of a lull, but they're gonna have, right now they have llamas and sheep and some horses. And then they're gonna be bringing in pigs and chickens and, but they, they turkeys mm -hmm. and they bring the little kids out there and they like to the horse and hold mm -hmm. on to its leg and they listen to its tummy make gurgles <laughs> and just the most it's wonderful wonderful yeah. uh, and they're very excited uh the tie-in here which is um they're excited to work with us to help achieve uh actions that will help us get sustainable pa certification and we had sent them some preliminary items from that to see how we can work with them to help involve the community more in understanding where their food comes from. Awesome. And they're inviting residents, aren't they, into the farm area? I think that's part of a program. Well, they do, they do look for volunteers. I know a gentleman from my neighborhood would go over and volunteer. So they're always looking for you know, help. But um, did I miss any key things? I guess no. the only thing was uh, their concern is no one knows about them. Yeah, yeah. They're kind of hidden back there, and they want to commit, They want to brag about what they're up to. They should. They've got the right to do that. And I think they'd uh, enjoy any assistance that we could give in, in that area as well. I, I mean, I'm thankful because I consider it as well. Mm -hmm. Township. I knew, I knew their program and I knew part of what they did, but they've taken it by taking on this animal. They're actually taking it with them. Mm -hmm. And kids get to experience the whole process of basically farm behavior. One of the things that was my favorite comment that when one of the young kids got home. They didn't want the vegetables that they could get from the store. They wanted the vegetables they could get from the garden because they knew the difference that they could get from the restaurant. Oh, wow. And that says a whole lot. Mm -hmm. And that'll be the thing that, you know, we've talked, I think it was with this group, about, you know, the desire to have, you know, a community garden. And in order to make that work, you need to get that excitement at that age level because it's going to, that's what will get a family involved in it uh, to make it happen. So, you know, it's, I thought it was, you know, a really excellent opportunity to see what they're doing. As you said, they, they're looking for us to kind of do that. We're fortunate that we live in a community that 
uh, even though we're as built out as we are, we have an area that's as very rural in a yeah. lot of ways as farm is farm can be. And and you go on that and you feel like you're stepped away mm -hmm. uh, from all of the, what's right around. Yeah, that's a big yeah. yeah. There's a lot that we're going to work with them on over the next get their word out. And also, the, uh, the, uh, the they just I mean, had a big event there, didn't they? A flea yeah, market yeah, or something? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's a great August, idea. Yeah. 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 And they, they posted bird walks for the township. Yeah. And, yeah. and I know before the 4 H programs used to, I mean, were phenomenal. I mean, some of the programs, it would be great if they could replicate some of those things just for kids that would be outside of their school as well. I mean, it's, it's an awesome program. It sounds urban, wonderful. The urban route is farm. Yes. Um, like, Yep. Yep. Public comment. No public comment this evening. Uh, and items for our next agenda that would be the January agenda. Now, um, we had two or three meetings. Oh. I'm sorry, one more sustainable business update. That's me. Um, thanks everybody for getting me the, the input for that. I packaged it up and sent it on to uh, Suzanne, uh, who must be bombarded with all this stuff. Because I was a little bombarded, but she must be major bombarded. Yes. <laughs> um, so Doesn't help that she's doing HR as well. And right oh, now, yeah. <laughs> open enrollment. So she's getting oh, with open yeah. enrollment plus this. So. Yeah. We're hitting her with all of it. It's all due at the same time. Mm -hmm. so. so our next phase for us is uh, really to think the requirement is to provide documentation for our activities. We just define the activities in a, in a Word document. Now we've got to come up with some uh, web links or some documentation uh, for those items. But we're not ready to bombard Suzanne for that stuff quite yet. As you get it, go ahead and send it because okay. we're starting to load things up on the website. Oh, okay. And get All right. Ready. So okay. We're working on a working on a uh, kind of a process to do it. Is people send it to us, and it's better to have it kind of trickle in. Oh, okay. And have it all yeah. like a mind dump all in yeah. one day. Because I know, yeah, I, yeah, we sent in ours. We did. included yeah. all of the links already. We, when we sent you that document, it had everything, mm -hmm. links for every, the flyers yeah. or whatever you need. Okay. I know that she has some. She's yeah. already put yeah. So okay. anything you have, you know, she's trying to get all that up. What is the timeline for that for the township? I mean, did we get a certain level by? Our goal is to get as much in by about the middle of November. We could potentially go to the end of November, but our goal is to get as much in as we can by the middle of November. So we can go live on the PA website uh, and do that. If we're not quite ready, if we're a week behind, I'm not going to speak over it, but I'd really like to be done by the getting everything in. Knowing that we see this as an ongoing, this is not just a right. like it's this isn't a one and done. As we go along, we'll keep upgrading it and keep doing it, but we want to have our big push. And I'd like to be able to say by the end of the year, we've achieved X um, in, in where we are. And then whether that's bronze or silver, depending on how much information we have. I went to their website, Sustainable PA, and uh, looked at uh, some of the rest surrounding communities that are a part of Sustainable that they did so you could go into there yeah see what's going on so good way of getting some ideas, ideas. yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and stuff. that's the whole purpose of it is to see how people are doing you know not everything is said exactly the same in every community and that you have to do x to achieve this but what is it that you're doing to make yourself sustainable no public comment, no public comment. Uh, items for next next agenda, that, that, that would be in uh, January. I'll put out a poll for that, and see if anybody has uh, uh, suggestions how we should bring in. And uh, in terms of renewable or sustainable uh, Newtown Square action items, did, did I put that on the agenda or 
Is that something you guys have? I think I think that we had put it under the old updates. And it, you said, I think it ended oh. up in two places. Okay. Okay. I think it was just to keep it maybe on your future agendas okay. until you felt like you had achieved whatever it was. Okay. Great. And it'll kind of remain on the old old business mm -hmm. ongoing. Right. Okay. Yes, because that would be an, a good way of getting the information out there, how we are progressing. Because yes, exactly. The, and Bruce, if you do. could just throw on the agenda for January, just tentative Arbor Day, just, just to have, you know, that on the calendar, because that would impact, you know, the schools and everything else. So just mm -hmm. as long as we get the date by mm -hmm. PHS or something from that time, if we can, if we start the planning on that. Um, if the PAC is responsible for that. Oh, that's, that's right. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. That's true. Won't we be working with them then? Definitely work with them. But right. It's a function of who takes the lead. Okay. No worries. If they're taking the lead, just as long as we know. So we might be coordinating with them too because yeah. they haven't done it before. Okay. With that, I'll uh, Perfect. bring the meeting to adjourn. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Yay. See you in January. Yeah. Happy holidays, everyone. Happy holidays.